Let us continue to worship God in prayer. Almighty God, everlasting Father, we remember the works of the Lord, your faithfulness, and your steadfast love us, love for us. We thank you for calling us to be your children from before the foundation of the world. Open our minds and enable us to understand your sovereign plan for our lives and use us to accomplish your purpose for us. Father, use your feeble servant to accomplish your purpose for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We've been studying the Torah for some time, and we've seen Moses in action as the leader of Israel. Moses is one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. In fact, Deuteronomy 34, verse 10 says, There has not risen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. But Moses is not a hero. In our society, we think of a great leader as a hero. Heroes stand out from the crowd. They have the capability to make decisive interventions. When things fall apart, heroes intervene and set things straight. But the word hero is not the biblical term for a leader. In the Bible, the most often used term for a leader is a servant. When God speaks to Moses, God refers to him as my servant. And when Moses speaks to God, he refers to himself as your servant. A leader is a servant. Servants have one quality that heroes don't have. Servants are faithful to their master. Servants are faithful to God, not just when things are going well, but even when things are falling apart. Faithful to God in small, ordinary things. Faithful to God even when they are not recognized. In the end, the life of the hero is about all the great things the hero did. But the life of a servant is really about God. Today I invite you to reflect with me on the life of Moses, focusing on his development as a leader. And also reflect on our own development as leaders. And we are going to do that through... Next slide, please. Through a general framework set forth by Dr. J. Robert Clinton in his book, The Making of a Leader. There are countless books on leadership, but this is the one that resonates me the most. As we mentioned already, a leader is a servant. Being a leader is not defined by a title or a position. It does not require a formal training or a seminary degree. It does not require having hundreds of followers. 
if you have influence on perhaps three or four people, then probably you are a leader. How you define a leader is not important. What is important is what kind of leader you are becoming. The main thesis of the book, The Making of a Leader, is that God develops a leader over a lifetime, especially through times of testing and crises. Notice that it's not our gifts or talents that make us a leader. It is God who develops a leader according to his sovereign purpose. Notice also that the making of a leader is not a semester-long class, but a development that takes the entire lifetime. In this book, Dr. Clinton outlines a generalized pattern of our life timeline. It is a generalized pattern so it will not fit everyone's timeline exactly, but I hope you recognize that uh, there is a pattern in your life and know that, that God has sovereign purpose for you and that God is developing you as a leader. So according to this generalized pattern, God develops a leader through five phases. And I invite you to consider your life in the life of the, this pattern. The first phase of the timeline is God's sovereign foundations. Next slide, please. So let's start with the life of Moses. Moses was born in Egypt to Hebrew slaves. At the time of his birth, there was an order from the Pharaoh that every Hebrew male infant must be thrown into the Nile. Moses should have been killed as an infant, but the Hebrew midwives and the mother of Moses resisted the Pharaoh's order. To make the long story short, the baby Moses was picked up by the Pharaoh's daughter, and he grew up in the Pharaoh's palace. He enjoyed all the privileges and affluence of Egypt. He received the finest education that Egypt had to offer. He spent four, first 40 years of his life in the palace, immersed in wealth and status. So all of these, both good and bad, are situations that we have no control over. And they are God's sovereign foundations. God has laid the foundations for each one of us according to his sovereign purpose. Of course, not everything that happens in life is according to God's will. But God is in control. And he can redeem even the bad things. All things both good and bad, work together for good for those who love God. All things. So our family background, our parents, the people who cared for us, the social economic conditions we are born into, the complicated family situation, the early education we received, all of which we have no control over. But they are God's sovereign foundations. Of course, we realize them only in retrospect. It's difficult to see the significance when we are in the middle of a bad situation. We don't know why God is allowing bad things to happen to us. But even when we don't know what God is doing, it's important that we trust God. We trust that God has laid the foundations for our life and is preparing us 
to be used by him. And the important task of leadership during phase one is to learn to take responsibility for our life, develop self-discipline, and develop competency in various subjects. Next slide, please. Phase two is inner life growth. During this phase, we might receive some training in leadership or ministry. We might be exploring the gifts that God has given us, trying out different gifts. We might be given some responsibility in ministry. We might even be used by God in some leadership capacity. However, what God is really concerned about is not how much ministry we are doing, but what happens inside us. God is forming Christ in us. What matters is the person we are becoming. When Moses was about 40 years old, he began to identify with the sufferings of his own people. He was wanting to be angry about injustice, but another thing to take vengeance into his own hands. Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and he killed the Egyptian, and he became a fugitive running for life. How drastically his life changed. From a prince in Egypt to a nobody in the desert of Median, tending sheep in the desert. That was not what Moses planned to do. That was not where he wanted to be. But he was unfit for ministry. We know with the benefit of hindsight that God was working out his sovereign purpose in Moses, putting Moses in the desert for 40 years, preparing him to be the leader of Israel. But nobody wants to spend 40 years in a training camp. We want to bypass it and quickly jump over to real ministry, what we want to do. But this phase is the most important phase in life. Somebody once said, God works ASAP, meaning as slow as possible. Why as slow as possible? Because the training is not for skills, but for inner transformation. It takes a long time for our heart to change, and even longer time for our character to change. During this phase, we need to learn to pray. Instead of the childish prayer of asking just for what we want, we need to learn to pray the kingdom prayer, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We need to learn to submit to the Word of God. Instead of picking and choosing what we want to hear, we need to seek the whole counsel of God and submit to the Word of God. During this phase, God often allows us to go through the test. It could be situations of adversity, trials and waiting, as in the case of Moses. But it could also be the most subtle situations of affluence, status, and success, which are actually more dangerous because they are too subtle to be recognized as the test of faith. So when the test comes, we need to learn to recognize it. The closer we are to Christ, the better we are able to recognize it. The more honest we are before the Word of God, 
the better we are able to recognize the test when it comes. Now, once we recognize the test, we must respond to the test not according to the desires of the flesh, but according to the Word of God. By responding to and living out the Word of God, we learn the lessons that God wants us to learn. And our inner life grows. And we become better prepared for ministry. However, we can fail the test. There are at least three ways we can fail the test. First, we don't even recognize the test, so we don't even resist the temptation. Second, we deny that it's a test. We lie to ourselves that it's not too bad. We justify our lies. Third, we may recognize the test, but we respond to it according to the desires of the flesh. So we fail. Now, when we fail, it's absolutely crucial that we learn the lessons that God wants us to learn. You see, failure is a great teacher, and we must not waste the lesson. Dr. Clinton writes in his book, if the person doesn't learn, he will usually be tested, tested again in the same areas. Now, this is extremely important. Let me repeat it. If the person doesn't learn, he will usually be tested again in the same areas. Every week, some prominent Christian leaders fall. Most likely, that's not the first time they failed in the same area. Only God knows. But most likely, they've been living in sin for many, many years. They refused to learn the lesson. And finally, they were exposed. So phase two, the period of, of inner growth, is the most important phase in your life. Again, what God is concerned about is not your work of ministry, but your inner growth. God is forming Christ in you. And what God wants from you is the Christ-like person you are becoming. So in phase two, what emerges from within you is integrity. Integrity means that you are the same person inside and outside. Integrity means that you don't lie to yourself. Integrity means that you have clear conscience before God. The next slide, please. Phase three is ministry maturing. In this phase, ministry becomes the primary focus of life. Now, if you are a lay leader, you don't need to quit your job, but you are more intentional about reaching out to others. You are more intentional about using your gifts to serve God. In phase three, you sense that you are where God wants you to be. And you are fulfilling God's purpose in your life. For some people, God calls them to phase three of their life when they're young. For example, David, Joseph, Daniel. But for some others, God waits until they are very old. So the point is that your age doesn't matter. God called Moses at the age of 80 to lead the people of Israel. However, for Moses, this phase of his life turned out to be anything but what he had hoped for. 
right from the start, the people began to complain, grumbling about the hardships, complaining about the food, murmuring about going back to Egypt. Their rebellion became increasingly unrestrained, and Moses faced conflict after conflict with the people. Now, conflicts are unavoidable in ministry, but what matters is over what we are in conflict. There are many minor and trivial things in ministry that can be surrendered or that can be worked out through a compromise. But there are some weightier matters that have to do with violating God's holiness, treating God with contempt, or worshiping idols. These are not matters of personal opinion. They're matters of life and death for the congregation. And one quality that sets Moses apart from all many other leaders is his utmost faithfulness to God in spite of the enormous oppositions. He was under tremendous pressure to please the people it would have been much easier for him if he became a people pleaser. But regardless of how powerful the opponent was, Moses would remain faithful to God. He would not compromise the word of God. He would uphold the holiness of God. As we saw last Sunday, all of the Israelites all the congregation of Israel, all the adults, rejected Moses as the leader of Israel. They wanted to choose another leader and go back to Egypt. Moses was perhaps the most unpopular leader in the history of Israel. In today's text from Numbers 16, Moses faces another conflict. By now, it's old news. This is 10th or 11th conflict since they came out of Egypt. But this time, there's something different about the conflict. The main instigators are the Levites, those who have been entrusted with taking care of God's sanctuary. And the leader of this rabble is Korah, who is a Levite from the clan of Kohath. He also brings some of the Reubenites along with 250 leaders of Israel. And they say to Moses and Aaron in verse 3, Numbers chapter 16, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Now, their argument is cogent. They are theologically correct. Indeed, the whole community is holy. If we look at this through the lens of the later Protestant Reformation, it sounds like they are advocating the priesthood of all believers. How wonderful that is. But listen to what Moses says to them. Verse 8. Now listen, you Levites. Isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near himself to do the work at the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community and minister to them? He has brought you and all you, your fellow Levites near himself. But now you are trying to get the priesthood too? So what's the issue? Now what's confusing here is that Moses and Aaron are also Levites, meaning they are descendants of Levi. All the priests are Levites. 
But the Levites are not necessarily priests. Out of all the Levites, God has chosen only Aaron and his descendants to serve as the priests. Only the priests could minister at the the altar of burnt offerings and enter the tabernacle proper. Now, that's not because Aaron and his sons were any better than the rest of the Levites or the rest of the Israelites. No. It's only because the Lord has chosen Aaron and his son and set them apart. The heart of the matter is that God is holy. And only God chooses whom he's going to set apart for his purpose. If you remember what happened to the priests, the two eldest sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, it's actually extremely dangerous to be priests. You remember that they were struck down by the Lord because they brought unauthorized fire showing contempt toward God's holiness. But here, Korah and other Levites presume that they can set themselves apart. They can approach the Holy God on their own terms. They presume that they can ordain themselves as priests. Their talk about the priesthood of all believers is nothing more than a cover for their desire for status. Again, Moses faces opposition over and over. And this is getting repetitive in the book of Numbers. So what does the life of Moses teach us about phase three, ministry maturing? Ministry maturing does not mean that you are successful in ministry or you are becoming popular. It simply means that you are where God wants you to be. And that you are being used by God to fulfill His purpose. You might not see visible fruit during this phase, but what matters is that you are being used by God for His purpose to fulfill God's purpose. You see, what God requires of you is not success, but faithfulness. So remember the faithfulness of Moses in spite of the enormous oppositions. And most of all, remember the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ. His faithfulness led him to the cross. Next slide, please. Phase four is life maturing. In this phase, your character as a leader is maturing. Your life begins to bear fruit. And your work in ministry begins to bear fruit. According to Dr. Clinton, in this phase, communion with God becomes foundational. Of course, communion with God should always be foundational, but by phase four, your inner life has grown more mature, and your communion with God is more intimate, and Ministry simply flows out of your communion with God. For Moses, I believe that this life maturing phase comes toward the end of his life in Deuteronomy. By the time we get to Deuteronomy, all of the first generation who rebelled against God and Moses have died in the wilderness. The second generation who grew up in the wilderness, are more open and more obedient. They are willing to obey the word of God and go into the promised land. 
And we find a sense of hope in the message of Moses in Deuteronomy. So Moses, at the end of his long life, finally sees his life bearing fruit among the next generation. This is what we long for in ministry. Our character maturing and our life and ministry bearing fruit. But the most fundamental thing is our character. Next slide, please. Dr. Clinton reminds us in his book, mature ministry flows from a mature character formed in the graduate school of life. Ministry can be successful through giftedness alone, but a leader whose ministry skills outstrip his character formation will eventually falter. Character formation is fundamental. Ministry flows out of being. Finally, the last slide, please. Phase five is convergence. This is where all that God has given, given you in life, your background, your gift, your temperament, your training, your knowledge, your experience, all of these converge to yield the fruit that is far beyond your natural ability. Dr. Clinton notes that not many leaders experience convergence. I'm not sure where Dr. Clinton would place Moses at the end of his life in Deuteronomy. Perhaps faithful servants of God, if they don't get to experience convergence on earth, they will do so in God's everlasting kingdom. So whatever phase you are in, in your development as the servants of God, trust that God has created you for His purpose. God has called you from before the foundation of the world to be His children, and His sovereign hand is upon you. He is working out His plan for your life. And He is developing you all throughout your life to be used by Him for His sovereign purpose and for His glory. As I close this message, I would like to invite you to a moment of silent meditation. So in the silence of our hearts, let us reflect on God's sovereign hand in our life circumstances. And know that God is working out His plan for us and developing us to be His servant. Father, you have begun a good work in us. We ask you, O oh Father, to bring it to completion so that your name would be magnified through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.